Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Jake Wynn from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine coming at you for another one of our live programs hosted by the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. We are on YouTube today, uh, stepping in for our monthly uh, historic happy hour that we have been doing for uh, since 2021 began. Very excited to have you all with us today. I am joined by my friends, uh, Dr. Melissa DeVelvis and Emily Hubner today. We're gonna to be talking about women in Civil War medicine. Uh, we are commemorating Women's History Month and we thought uh, now is the perfect time to have a conversation to share some brief vignettes uh, of, of some women uh, in Civil War medicine. Of course, there are thousands upon thousands of women who uh, take on medical roles of various kinds during the American Civil War. We can't talk about all of them today, so we're going to highlight a few stories that we find really compelling that connect to our personal research or our work. Um, and we're going to talk, talk to you about some of those stories today. Um, Hopefully out there, it is a historic happy hour. So uh, grab your favorite frosty beverage and join us uh, for, for a conversation. Uh, Emily, perfect. Uh, and uh, Melissa, perfect, uh, perfect drinks uh, there. Uh, we are so excited uh, that all 50 of you right now are, are watching live with us. Uh, if you are enjoying the video uh, and our other videos here on the Civil War Medicine Museum's YouTube channel, please go ahead and click that like button, that little, little thumbs up, give us a thumbs up, subscribe. Uh, it'll give you more content like this uh, and also other content as well. We are sharing uh, photos, um, links to articles that we have on our website as well as elsewhere. Uh, please uh, subscribe and you will get more and more stories like this one today. And if you do enjoy uh, video programs like this one, you can take your support to the next level and become a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. You'll directly support programs like this one today uh, and also get lots of cool perks as well. Uh, you get to come and visit the museums um, that we have for free. Uh, that includes the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland, the Pry House Field Hospital Museum on Antietam National Battlefield, which we will be opening a little bit later this spring, and the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum in Washington, DC, which is typically where I'm stationed. Uh, and also, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about Clara Barton uh, later on in today's program. I am joined today by a wonderful uh, panel here. Uh, first, we have uh, uh, Dr. Melissa DeVelvis. She has a PhD in history from the University of South Carolina, specializing in the Civil War era, gender studies and sensory and emotions history. She just successfully defended her dissertation about women and the secession crisis in South Carolina entitled Gendering Secession, Women and Politics in South Carolina, 1859 to 1861. And I'm also joined today by Emily Hubner, who is the Assistant Director of the Heart of the Civil War Heritage Area, supporting heritage tourism in Maryland's Carroll, Frederick, and Washington counties. Prior to joining the Heritage Area in 2017, she worked at the Maryland State Archives on the study of the legacy of slavery in Maryland and the Revolutionary Era, uh, Revolutionary War Era Maryland 400 project. Uh, she holds a BA in History and Spanish and was recently accepted to the History Leadership Institute run by the American Association for State and Local History. Uh, with introductions out of the way, how are you both doing today? Doing well, Jake. Uh, happy to be here. Excellent. This is probably the closest I'll get to being one of those commentators on drunk history, so you know, I'm really <laughs> excited. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, I have to say that working at the Civil War Medicine Museum, we provide a lot of opportunities for such, uh, <laughs> such comparisons to drunk history. So um, if you... Um, on just a second. Um, if you uh, are enjoying uh, today's program, like I said before, um, you can uh, support us through membership to the museum. So you'll find a link in our program uh, to in our comment section to join um, as a member of the museum. Thank you all so much. We have some of our uh, some of our uh, members actually tuning in with us today. We want to thank you all out there uh, for, for tuning in with us. Some of our folks tuning in today. Uh, let's uh, go through our list. We've got folks watching in West Virginia, Lakeland, Florida, uh, Estonia tuning in with us today. 
Um, I got lots of congratulations as well uh, for, uh, for Melissa on your, uh, on your dissertation. Uh, congratulations uh, from the comment section on YouTube. <laughs> Excellent, and uh, thank you all so much for, for tuning in with us. If you are watching and uh, want to drop in where you're watching from, it's always nice for us to know where your folks are tuning in from. Um, so we're gonna turn it over and start our vignettes today. We're gonna go over to, uh, to Melissa. Uh, you can take it away and start our women's history program here on Historic Happy Hour. Hello, hello, and thank you to uh, Natural Museum of Civil War Medicine for continuing to give me an outlet to just ramble on about my favorite nurses. Uh, and thank you, YouTube, for your wonderful congratulations. Um, sometimes, and I swear in my dissertation, I said that time is a social construct and it really feels like one now because, um, gosh, you know, Jake, we're almost coming up on like a year of, obviously a year of solitude, but a year of being a doctor in the weird abyss that is um, academia right now. But uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my two figures that I'm going to ramble on about because I love so dearly um, are uh, Cornelia Hancock and Susie King Taylor. So I'll start with Hancock uh, just because um, I've written actually for the uh, Claire Barton uh, Museum and Office for uh, about nurses. Um, as, uh, as Jake mentioned, my research focuses a lot on kind of sensory and emotions history, especially with women and gender. And so I really got into Hancock when I was looking at the sensory numbness experienced during wartime and how this kind of, whether it's trauma-based or not, it's not just about the soldiers. The nurses are, especially field nurses, are experiencing very similar um, experiences of trauma but then also it's new in a gendered way and that women weren't even supposed to like touch a man on the shoulder if they were not intimately acquainted. And so that's kind of how I came in to Cornelia Hancock. Her Civil War letters are published and a lot of people are familiar with these letters because they are just a wonderful window into what it was like to be on the front. And so her descriptions of the war are kind of how I started to look into her as a person. So some backstory, Cornelia Hancock was born in um, February of 1840. Um, she was a Quaker girl from Salem, New Jersey. And I say girl because when she wanted to go to the front as a nurse, uh, she was just 23 years old. And in a commonly told story was so young that Dorothea Dix objected to her beautiful, her beauty and her rosy cheeks and did not actually accept her uh, to be working with Dix and others as nurses because she was too young and too pretty. Uh, this was very much a concern in the military hospitals of um, would it be impure for someone young and single to be a nurse? Uh, so uh, uh, to quote a few more contemporary people, nevertheless, she persisted. Um, luckily, her um, brother-in-law, Dr. Child, was a surgeon. And so she followed him um, and kind of used some passes from him to go to the front herself. And she first arrived at the battlefield at Gettysburg three days after the um, battle itself in July of 1863. And she just hits the ground running and does not stop. Um, I want to say does not stop till the end of the war, but she keeps working <laughs> um, until essentially until she dies in some form helping people. So she's so neat. Um, she follows uh, usually, I believe it's the, yeah, it's the second army corps. Um, throughout the war. She goes through Battle of Wilderness. She's there at the Siege of DC. She's there, as I mentioned, at Gettysburg. Um, she's also stationed at several uh, contraband hospitals. And so what this is, is these are hospitals for um, escaped formerly enslaved people who are listed as contraband. And so these are not always um, military patients. They are just um, incredibly malnourished and under cared for uh, populations who have made it to freedom, but freedom does not know what to do with them. And so it is there where she first kind of cues into the plight um, for racial equality or the existing racial inequalities, even in so-called freedom. Um, and so she is never attached to the U.S. Sanitary Commission. She is never attached to any of these organizations. She is receiving 
funding from the Society of Friends in her hometown. So the Quakers, as they were um, a huge part of the Underground Railroad and other peace and abolition movements, they are just as um, fundamental here. And such is her um, strength as an organizer and a professional that no group of soldiers or army groups ever really turns her away after this point. After Dorothea Dix, she is just unquestioned when she arrives. And um, she even says at one point, she is such a high ranking member of the rank and file that there's no worries that soldiers will ever be like imputed to her or anything like this. So where did I get in touch with Hancock? Well, the first time, the first thing she writes about Gettysburg is the smell um, and how her senses were benumbed. So this, there's this idea of trauma and numbness that I just immediately jumped into. Um, she says several times, I feel assured I shall never feel horrified at anything that may happen to me hereafter. She has to defend to her family at home. Um, she says, you think, you will think it is a short time for me to get used to things, but it seems to me as if my path past life was a myth. These screams of agony no longer make an impression. And she even says, quote, I could stand by and see a man's head taken off. Due to the extens or extensive exposures to Gettysburg, um, she says the amputating table just ran with blood for days and the, um, the wagons would pull the limbs away and just immediately come back with more. And so uh, talk about Drama, talk about becoming numb to such horrifying experiences. Um, at some point, sometimes it makes her feel callous. Uh, she has to write home when a family member reports on a neighbor's death. She says, quote, it does not appear to me as if one death is anything to me now because she's used to the suffering. And so she says, well, what is the death of kind of one neighbor when I have friends who I have cared for who die all of the time? Uh, she also gets... Um, gently chided by her uh, Quaker family um, due to her improper activities on the front. She's living alone, she's riding horseback. And she says, again with the shade, um, she, that they, those complaining, quote, cannot expect everyone to be satisfied to live in as small a circle as themselves in these days of great events. So <laughs> she very much defends her position. She says, everyone swears here, quote, if I do when I get home, you need not be surprised. Um, and she says, quote, a soldier's life is very hardening because she got her tooth pulled without flinching. And so she is included in this soldier's life. So she's talking about all of these activities where she is following the troops around. She's often in kind of these pop-up hospitals, sometimes in real hospitals, but she just really just becomes benumbed to these things in a way that helps her keep moving. Uh, and has to defend these unladylike activities to those around her. And so she does not spend a lot of time going home, not even to um, see her mother. Uh, after the war, she accepts an offer from the Friends, so the Quakers Association for the Aid and Elevation of Freedmen, um, to go start a school for Black children near Charleston. Um, she very much is an abolitionist. She even complains about other abolitionists saying, quote, you cannot help thinking that we're all these good abolitionists North that could do so much talking and so little acting. Um, she sees immediately the problems with presidential reconstruction. She says that um, if, quote, the Negro was taken away from the protection of such men, such as General Saxon, um, he organized um, uh, Black troops in the South and part of the Freedmen's Bureau initially before he was removed by uh, President Johnson. Um, and she says, if you take them away from the Freedmen's Bureau, take that protections away, she says, quote, you will have inaugurated as near an approach to slavery as it is possible. So essentially saying, um, seeing this initial reconstruction for what it is, which is attempts to bring slavery back about as quickly as possible. Um, she works at a school in Beaufort or Mount Pleasant. Oh no, um, <laughs> I'll find it real quick, sorry. Uh, from 1866 until her resignation from ill health in 1875. And so she is teaching at a school for 10 years afterwards. 
Um, and that school actually uh, continued to be an institution. Um, it was called the Laying School. It was L-A-I-N-G. And it existed for a very long time in the Charleston and Lowcountry area um, and was a school for African-Americans in the region. And she said in her diary or in her letters that African-Americans learn just as well as any white child I've ever taught, if not better. And so she kind of doesn't have this idea of a paternalistic approach to education that you see with some white nurses or white educators such as Laura Town. Uh, so after she leaves from ill health uh, in 1875, she moves up to Philadelphia and forms and works for the Society for Organizing Charity in Philadelphia's Sixth Ward. Um, a lot of these programs involve education, children, teaching women, um, a lot of these reform movements that we'd see from progressives such as like Jane Addams, um, she even moves to a community called Wrightsville in South Philadelphia, which is a social experiment to see if poor, when given the poor, when given these tools can move out of the cycle of poverty. Um, and eventually by 1914, many of the tenants in Wrightsville in South Philadelphia are able to purchase their own homes. Now she's 74 by 1914, she retires and lives 13 more years until she dies in the household of her niece. So the woman never sleeps. She never married. She was, I would say, married to her work, but uh, she is a fascinating person um, and uh, a fascinating nurse during the Civil War. Uh, Susie King Taylor, born um, Susie Baxter, has similar experiences on the front. I believe she says, and I'm going to scroll down to get her quotes exactly, um, that she learns to shoot a gun um, and is quite good at it, actually. Yeah, she says, quote, I learned to handle a musket very well while in the regiment and could shoot straight and often hit the target. I assisted in cleaning the guns and used to fire them off to see if the cartridges were dry before cleaning and reloading each day. Susie King Taylor was the first black nurse um, for the Union Army, and she is one of the only, if not the only, black woman to write reminiscences about her time as a nurse in the Civil War. Her reminiscences, I believe, are open access so you can read them yourself. Um, she is listed as a laundry woman or a laundress uh, when she starts to help the first core of what they call the colored troops. This is one of the earliest, if not the earliest group of black soldiers. They are formed from South Carolina and Georgian, um, usually um, Gullah peoples. And so they are formerly enslaved African-Americans who are not fighting. They, they eventually become the 33rd colored troops. Uh, they uh, are different from what we usually know from the movie Glory, which is the 54th of Massachusetts. These were um, free African-Americans who are now fighting. And so this is made up of formerly enslaved people. She is listed as a laundress, but very quickly becomes a nurse that accompanies them. She is, um, at the age of 14, she and her family uh, basically leave and refugee to St. Simon's Island, which has been, yes, good, pictures of Taylor. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> She very does little of laundry and is employed doing other things because at 14, when she and her family escaped to St. Simon's, which was held by the U.S. Army in uh, late 1862, uh, she is one of the few his, who is literate and starts to teach um, students by day and then members of the troops by night. Uh, she was able to become literate because she spent much of her youth in Savannah with her grandmother, who was actually a free African-American. And she went to schools in secret that taught in South Carolina. And she talks about how she had to essentially have a pass and had to be home by 1030 as there was a curfew for people of color in Savannah. Um, so she is moving with the uh, U.S. Army and the um, first South Carolina throughout Beaufort, throughout, um, they even go as far as Charleston, Battery Wagner, they go down to Savannah and then even Jacksonville and she is with them every step of the way. Um, she uh, meets her husband there um, and they uh, marry and that is where she gets the name Taylor from and uh, follows them until they muster out essentially. So she says, she, at one point a boat capsizes near Ladies Island in South Carolina and um, they were not found. They were floating for four hours. Had the tide been going out, she would have been carried to sea and would have died. Um, she talks about uh, going along the picket lines herself. She says when she is near um, 
Battery Wagner, which we know was a brutal assault on the 54th Massachusetts, she sees skulls lying about and she often had to move them out of the way of the path. Um, and she describes the gruesome sight of, quote, those fleshless heads and grinning jaws. Um, but she says, by this time, quote, I had become accustomed to worse things and did not feel as if I might have earlier in my camp life. And again, she is describing boys, boys who are returning with legs off, arms off, foot off, wounds of all kinds imaginable. And then she says, quote, my work now began. I gave my assistance to try and alleviate their sufferings. So she is describing these horrible activities of distress and then says, time to work. And so she too is experiencing kind of this numbing as she is helping out throughout the war. Her husband, Edward, after the war, when they must her out, um, he was a skilled carpenter, but he could not get work because of his race. So he had to work near Savannah as a longshoreman. So he's kind of getting the stuff off of the river boats and dies in a docking accident in September, 1866, a few months before the, work, the birth of his son. So Susie King Taylor after the war is a young widow with a newborn and she tries to set up several schools to continue to teach literacy like she did before. Unfortunately, she charges tuition to, you know, have some form of support, but now there are more and more free public schools for African-Americans, which on one hand is great, but on the other hand takes money away from Taylor and she has to become a domestic servant, um, which is beneath the amazing things that she's done, but eventually that family that she works for moves up to Boston and she chooses to stay in Boston, um, marries a man who is where she gets the name Taylor from, and naturally I'm forgetting his first name while everyone's looking at me. Um, and so she lives the rest of her life up in Boston rather than uh, in the South. And as her reminiscences close, she really talks about how freedom has not been gained for African Americans. She talks about Jim Crow. She talks about being pushed to a segregated car when she's trying to go visit her ill son in the South. Um, and she talks about lynchings. And so she is a woman who, she says essentially, I find it ironic that my son, um, who was the child of a man who fought for the US Army and fought for freedom is not given the same freedoms. And so she spends the rest of her life kind of speaking out about um, racial inequality, especially from veterans who fought for uh, the Union. Um, and she, living in Boston, also becomes um, a member of the Women's Relief Corps in Boston, uh, which in actually becomes a president of those corps in 1893. And a lot of this was um, women who had formerly worked during the Civil War. Uh, so a lot of these kind of memorial associations and active associations. So the two women um, never met, from my records at least, uh, but they continued to, uh, they, it's strange, they pivoted from caretaking as nurses to caretaking and teaching as teachers. So they took these gendered forms of jobs that were acceptable and appropriate for them and took them as far as they were able to go. And uh, anyway, I think they're really fun. I've probably gone over time, but um, I love them and they're so neat. So thank you for listening to me ramble about them. Now that was Absolutely fantastic, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think some some words for all of us to remember, um, especially when it comes to uh, your work with sensory history and Cornelia Hancock and these experiences that she had and all of these other nurses had um, as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic as well. Um, thinking about the experiences of a lot of the healthcare workers today and those kind of sensory experiences as well. All right, so uh, we are going to go uh, over to Emily now. We're going to transition, uh, move away from the coast of South Carolina, uh, and move up to the heart of the Civil War heritage area in, in uh, central and western Maryland. Uh, I promise uh, we will come back to South Carolina in just a bit, and we're actually going to return to uh, Susie King Taylor for a little bit in the story of Clara Barton. But let's talk a little bit about the uh, ladies' Relief Association of Frederick. Awesome. Thank you, Jake. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. DeBelvis, for that fantastic story um, about both of those women. Um, I wanted to take us to a story about um, women during the Civil War and the women whose names we don't necessarily know, sort of similar to the roles of 
of individual soldiers whose names we don't know, you know, whereas we know some of the high flying generals and, you know, even captains and other officers, um, you know, when it comes to women and their charitable actions and their nursing during the Civil War, um, you know, there's a whole mass of unnamed women who also were doing that work um, during the war. So I want to talk a little bit about how women in Frederick stepped up to the plate um, and how, as a result of that, they were representatives of their communities, sort of in similar ways to soldiers on the march. Um, and how that very act of their caregiving was political, and it was a way of showing support for the Union, um, in the case often of the Frederick Ladies Relief Association, um, and also in cases where they're providing impartial care to Union and Confederate soldiers alike, it shows magnanimity and sort of the nobility of the individual caregiver and their cause. Um, and so in this society where so many actions are deeply gendered in the 1860s, um, women are able to bring pride to their own communities by organizing relief during the Civil War. You know, they're not waiting or being acted upon by others. They're really working proactively and they're receiving press um, in their local press. They're receiving praise for that organizing. Um, and so in August of 1861, the Union Ladies of Frederick met upstairs at the German Reformed Church Hall. Uh, quote, for the purpose of forming an association to minister to the wants and comfort of the sick and wounded Union soldiers in our midst. It is hoped that every true woman will attend and aid in this work of Christian charity. Um, and that location of their meeting, the old German Reformed Hall in Frederick, um, that's a common meeting place in Frederick. Um, you know, the Masons meet there, a couple other um, fraternal orders meet there, but also significantly that very same summer and actually just earlier that same month in August of 1861, the Maryland State Legislature met there uh, while the city was capital for a summer um, when Thomas Holiday Hicks, the governor, had moved the capital from Annapolis, which was seen as being a place that probably had more um, secessionist sympathies to Frederick, where it was sort of seen as being a safer place to make the decision of whether Fred Maryland should secede or not. Um, and so they had only adjourned a little bit earlier on August 7th. And then just later that month, the women of Frederick are meeting to see what they can do for the war effort. Um, and you can still see uh, this old hall of German Reformed Church. Uh, it's an architectural anchor in downtown Frederick at the corner of Church and Market Streets. And so if you come to Frederick City to come and see the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, definitely walk the downtown and you'll see some of these important buildings to the history of the city and also to women's history. Um, and so that meeting, 50 women responded to the call and they quickly formed committees. Um, they appointed a president, a secretary and other officers. Um, and according to the Frederick Examiner, each committee was assigned a day of the week to provide aid, which sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> um, so they appoint Mrs. Gideon Bantz. Um, her first name is Anne Maria, and she is their president. Um, Mr. Gideon Bantz had actually died in 1854. And so although the, I think he also had an, a son named Gideon, um, but if this is the widow Bantz, um, it's telling that she's still Mrs. Gideon Bantz almost a decade later, um, but also that her authority as the leader isn't only um, the authority of her husband, she's also an organizer in her own right, um, because Gideon Vance, you know, he's, he's a significant person in the community, um, and both he and Anne Maria are buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery, which is um, also walking distance from the old German Reformed Hall, and you can go and see them and Francis Scott Key's burial and other things at Mount Olivet. Um, so the association secretary is Margaret Hart. And so both Anne Maria Bantz and Margaret Hart crop up in the newspaper over the following years. Um, they'll thank donors publicly for their different donations. They'll tell you, you know, if they sent eggs or milk or, you know, money from the Ladies Association of New York. Um, and so they tell you about the donations and they publicly thank people, um, including other benevolent societies. Um, and so as high profile battle, battles are fought nearby, like the Battle of Antietam, even the Battle of Gettysburg, the Battle of Monocacy, um, more help comes to the city and it's administered in many cases through the Ladies Relief Association. Um, and so the women of Frederick, they've organized, they're prepared to do their duty in 1861. Um, but then there's also that the sense, maybe they won't get to do that. Um, because later that August, uh, there's an article in the newspaper that says that the military hospital is probably going to be moved to Baltimore as a more advantageous location. Um, previously, they wrote it had been in Hagerstown before they shifted it to Frederick. Um, and there's a sense that they're about to move it again. 
Um, and this article has almost a sense of indignation to it that they're taking it away from Frederick, who could take such good care of wounded soldiers. Um, they wrote, surely the sick and wounded will nowhere find more benevolent solicitude for their unfortunate condition than has been manifested here by the formation of the Ladies Relief Association, which is now in successful operation and is ministering plentifully and diligently to the wants of the poor soldiers. And this is in their first month, so things are clearly moving smoothly. Um, and we know that military hospital, it's going to remain in Frederick um, at the barracks, uh, the Hessian barracks, which this portion of them still stand, um, built in the 18th century to house prisoners during the American Revolution, and then it becomes a military hospital. And uh, I'm sure Jake knows a lot more about that hospital and the people who went through it. Um, and so there's that concern that the hospital might move. And then there's a different concern that pops up in the Frederick Examiner again, um, where it seems Frederick's charitable reputation is still at risk. And this is from none other than Dorothea Dix, who was mentioned with Cornelia Hancock. Um, so in October of 1861, there's a letter from Dorothea Dix, um, and this article mentions it, where apparently, uh, you know, she's the famous superintendent of army nurses, and she's writing to a woman in Philadelphia. And she asks that woman to, quote, send your next box to the hospital at Frederick City. There they need everything. Nothing will come amiss. And the Frederick Examiner writes a vigorous rebuttal to that. Um, they say, we don't know where Ms. Dix got this impression of the, quote, neglected condition of the military hospital at this place. Um, but they say they have the best medical authority for assuring her that she has been wrongly advised. And then they turn to the ladies of Frederick. Um, they are not behind their countrywomen anywhere in acts of charity or humanity, and many a convalescent soldier will bear grateful testimony to the kindness, assiduity, and ample provision they have made for his comfort and restoration to health. Um, then they say the Relief Association numbers some 50 ladies, um, and that mystics would no doubt be agreeably surprised if she could know the extent of their unostation unostentatious charity, which probably is part of why we don't know all of their names, or the amount of contributions from benevolent citizens quietly but discriminatingly distributed through this means. If this should meet her eye, we trust she will correct the imputation of neglect unwillingly put upon the patriotism and benevolence of this community. And so here it's showing that the re reputation of the city of Frederick um, as a union stronghold, as you know, an American city, it depends in part on the charitable works of its women. Um, and so, just like men are representing their community and their actions on the front lines, you know, people are concerned about, you know, the Maryland regiments. The whole city is interested in making a certain impression publicly um, on military officials, um, but also sometimes, especially on recuperating soldiers themselves who have come to the city to recover from all over the country, you know, from, from their homes. And so leaving a good impression um, is something that they wind up doing, and it seems like an aim. It's part of uh, the goodness of their cause. Um, and so there are newspaper articles throughout the 1860s that include messages like, um, you know, a message from the mothers and wives of Wisconsin thanking the women of Maryland in the aftermath of particular battles um, where they knew that, you know, the men in, in their wings of the army, uh, you know, if they were wounded, they were probably in our cities, um, also in the heart of the Civil War in places like Westminster and Frederick, Boonesboro and Hagerstown, um, you know, they're writing to the women of those cities. Um, and so also just quickly when it comes to skilled nursing, um, because the women, these, these associations, most of them are not trained, you know, they're not going to the Mexican American war, like some of the veterans who are fighting in the civil war. Um, but we do have some skilled nurses in this area, especially, um, the sisters of charity, they came down from Emmitsburg to help care for men at the military hospital in Frederick. They also responded to Gettysburg. Um, they were sent wherever they were needed. Um, and they had been trained as nurses. That's something that their order does. And they were so in demand that they in fact had to be applied for. There's an article where 10 sisters arrive in the city of Frederick and they make note of it in June of 1862. And it actually states that quote, competent female nurses were hard to find. And um, with the exacting standards of Dorothea Dix, I think she might be likely to agree. <laughs> um, but you can visit the home of the Sisters of Charity 
the National Shrine of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton up in Emmitsburg in Northern Frederick County today to learn more about the Sisters of Charity and their role as nurses during the Civil War and also in other conflicts abroad. Um, and so despite whatever the perception of regular civilian women's competence at nursing, um, people like Anne Maria Bance and her role as president of the Ladies Relief Association, she was still given a great amount of local authority um, and military medical professionals actually depended on her to communicate their needs and expectations, particularly to the women of Frederick, since they know that they're able to leverage you know, the power of the community and all of these women who have these networks who can get you milk and eggs and you know, any other thing you might need. She was someone that the community looked to and her management of that situation influences the public perception of the women of Frederick and their capabilities, um, including whether a city is loyal or not. Um, in April of 1863, uh, there is an article about the, quote, conduct and obnoxious demeanor of certain Tory females, meaning Southern sympathizing women who were visiting the Frederick Hospital um, to provide care. Um, but apparently, you know, arguments were breaking out all the time. There's um, sort of salacious stories that come out of, you know, a nurse from New York says something about how she's glad that Lincoln was murdered or, you know, someone else says something unkind to a Wisconsin widow. Um, everybody needs to be on their best behavior in these sort, sorts of situations um, or else it reflects poorly. Um, and so any woman who wanted to visit the military hospital and care give had to apply through Mrs. Gideon Bance of the Relief Association, it said. Um, it was General Orders Number 13 from the USA General Hospital, uh, which was written March 30th, 1863. And uh, so ladies desiring passes will apply to Mrs. Gideon Bance, president of the Relief Association of this city. Um, and gentlemen will apply personally at the office of the surgeon in charge of the hospital daily from two to three o'clock PM. And so, um, you know, it's significant that she's the conduit through which that woman power is made available to the military effort. Um, and so I also wanted to note that just a few months before the Frederick Ladies Relief Association was formed, the Herald of Freedom and Torchlight in Hagerstown um, they write about other women's um, relief associations that are being formed, but I came across this instance where a group was trying to similarly organize and they were arrested for it. Um, and this is sort of reminiscent of Susie King Taylor's story. Um, it said, quote, 20 free, 20 free blacks, mostly women, were arrested in town for violating a new law that prohibits blacks from being members of secret societies. The women in question were members of a benevolent society and had no knowledge of the law. And this was in March of 1861, so it's early on in the conflict. Um, and this newspaper, the Herald of Freedom and Torchlight, was generally sympathetic to African-Americans. It was a unionist paper. Um, and from what I've read, it was in favor of abolition when emancipation came. And so including this article is also a way to use that language of charity and of womanhood to point out how unjust it is that these women had what they would consider you know, the innate women's impulse to care give denied to them. You know, they don't get the dignity of that role. Um, sort of what Dr. DeVelvis was saying about, you know, after Susie King Taylor is, you know, she's done all of these things. She's a high flying person. You know, she's had all of these experiences in life, um, but she has to do something that's beneath her because nursing is, it has dignity to it. Um, and it has sort of an honor that we put on it. Um, and so the civil war resulted in heroics from great people who we've heard of, as well as people whose names we'll never know. Um, and that's true for men and for women. Um, and like men, women had to step into new arenas and they were able to apply their skills that frequently they already had um, in the name of charitable action and community organizing in new ways. Uh, in their case, it was work to help limit the damage of a devastating war that came to the heart of the civil war to Maryland and across the entire country. Um, and so just uh, finishing up, the Frederick Examiner wrote that, quote, since the commencement of the war, so many great traits of character have been discovered by loyal ladies in their advocacy of a union on the immutable principles of justice, that we begin to think there are great women besides those who answer the definition of the great Napoleon. And I'm not sure what Napoleon's definition was, but it seemed like a good note to end on. 
Um, and so thank you, Jake. And I look forward to chatting. Yeah, that was uh, that was great. Um, it, it, it very important to to recognize the role that women North and South had uh, throughout the conflict through these kinds of organizations, these these relief organizations. We, they, you, we cannot speak enough about all of the work that they did uh, during the conflict to to support uh, both soldiers and, and civilians. And, and Emily, I will say I. I have to, uh, your your uh, vignette today made me think of a post that we just put up on the uh, National Museum of Civil War Medicine's Facebook page, which I'm sharing a link to now, um, which is actually about a half century later uh, during the 1918 influenza pandemic. Um, it's an article from the Frederick Post about uh, the need for a monument dedicated to the volunteer nurses who assisted in hospitals and in homes during the pandemic. Um, that took place in 1918. Um, and I was just really struck by this article um, and how it kind of compares. And this is the daughters and the granddaughters of those who were, um, you know, carrying out nursing care during the during the Civil War in Frederick. And just to think of, you know, the the parallels through history um, that that you see and, and the need for for monuments and to commemorate all of these, uh, the, the women who who did these, in many cases, unsung roles. Um, throughout the conflict. All right, so we have folks tuning in from all over the place. Uh, I've seen some uh, Alabama's, New Mexico, Minnesota, Dublin, Ireland, uh, Vienna, Austria, uh, Long Island, New York, Ohio, New Hampshire. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in with us today. Uh, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to, to drop those in here. Uh, we'll be happy to get to them at the conclusion of the program. We have one more vignette today that I'm going to uh, deliver here in just a moment. Um, Emily, just so you know, Edward McDevitt says, nice to hear of the good works provided by the Sister of Ch Sisters of Charity. Um, so that one uh, going, to, going to you. Um, and I had a comment here, uh, didn't Susie, King Taylor and Clara Barton work together once. That's a comment here. Um, let's get into that now. Um, so we're going to transition over to, to talking about uh, Clara Barton and, uh, in 1863 in South Carolina. Um, I have a few images here that I'm going to bring up. So bear with me while I, uh, while I bring up the screen. All right. So there's our angel of the battlefield, Clara Barton. Uh, so. I do work at the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum, which is managed by uh, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. It's here in Washington, DC, which is where I'm broadcasting from today. Um, that museum is dedicated to sharing the story of Clara Barton's Civil War work, uh, what she did during the conflict, um, in the place where she lived uh, some of the time during the Civil War. Uh, it's her boarding house room uh, that ultimately at the end of the Civil War became the missing soldiers office, looking for missing Union soldiers at the conclusion of the, of the Civil War. Just to, to kind of dive right into what we're gonna be talking about today is, is not gonna be about the missing soldiers office. It's not gonna be about the angel of the battlefield part of the story yet. Those are very well known elements uh, comparatively. Um, what she does on the battlefield at Antietam uh, or at Fredericksburg or uh, Cold Harbor, Spotsylvania Courthouse, Petersburg, and what she does with the missing soldiers office after the Civil War. Specifically, we're gonna dive in today to what she does in South Carolina in 1863. This is a story that I've been spending a lot of time with recently and thought I would share it all with you. Just to bring you all up to speed, if you're not as familiar with Barton, uh, she was 39 years of age when the Civil War broke out, before the Civil War. Uh, no nursing experience, uh, as we know nursing today. Uh, she did have some caregiving experience from her youth, uh, assisting one of her brothers uh, in, in nursing him back to health when she was a child. Uh, she was a teacher, one of the first women to work for the federal government. And when the Civil War broke out, she became a relief worker and then ultimately a first aid responder, a battlefield nurse, gets the nickname of Angel of the Battlefield uh, after the Battle of Antietam. But in April of 1863, she goes to South Carolina and she goes to the Sea Islands of South Carolina, um, specifically to Hilton Head, uh, along with her brother, David Barton, uh, who was with the Quartermaster Department of the United States Army. She does land uh, in April 1863 at Hilton Head, uh, which was a U.S. Army base that had been secured in 1861. Um, 
in the Sea Islands of South Carolina. This is a series of islands, uh, the very southeastern part of South Carolina and the northeastern part of Georgia, collectively known as the Sea Islands. Uh, in July 1863, she traveled north from Hilton Head to Morris Island, uh, which is on the outskirts of Charleston with an ambulance and abundant medical supplies. Uh, she watched that month as fighting raged on Morris Island as U.S. forces attempt to take Battery Wagner, which was a Confederate position at the north end of Morris Island, one of the defenses of Charleston, um, actually right across uh, on the southern end of the, the harbor mouth. Uh, where Fort Sumter is out in the middle of the harbor. So as she's watching uh, U.S. Uh, Army forces try to take this battery, this sand and earth position, uh, out in the ocean, uh, there is a bombardment going on by the U.S. Navy for weeks and weeks on end uh, as the U.S. Navy tried to bombard both uh, Battery Wagner and Fort Sumter, uh, just pummel that into silence, which they never quite succeed at doing uh, until, until the end of the conflict. Uh, Barton witnessed firsthand the fighting on Morris Island on July 18th, 1863. Uh, this is made famous by the movie Glory. This is going to be the first, uh, not the first combat experience of the 54th Massachusetts, but definitely their most memorable combat experience and one that they're going to uh, be remembered for, uh, for a very long time. Um, in the aftermath of, of an unsuccessful assault on Battery Wagner. Uh, Barton leaves behind a vivid description of this battle. Um, she describes in a, in a letter uh, written just after the battle took place, uh, she says this, quote, the flash of a hundred guns and 10,000 muskets lit up the darkness of our desert island and the thunders of Wagner and Sumter shook it to its center. And on those bloody parapets, freedom and slavery met and wrestled hand to hand, and the rebel flag and the true, swelling in the same breeze, stood face to face while warriors met and fought and martyrs died. Through the long, terrible hours, we gazed and hoped and prayed at length. Must I write, turn back in despair to comfort our wounded and bury our dead? She ends the letter with, uh, with an exclamation point after the word repulsed. So in the wake of this failed assault um, in which the 54th Massachusetts plays a, a key role um, in this battle, Barton goes to work, um, something she had done since the battle of, uh, since before the Battle of Antietam in 1862. She goes to the makeshift field hospital, she bandages wounds, she slaps on tourniquets to stop the bleeding, and she did what she could to make the soldiers there comfortable and to do what she could to save lives. And this is notable for being both white soldiers and black soldiers um, who are coming into this field hospital in this terrible situation. Now this gets to where uh, Susie King Taylor comes back into the story because um, Clara Barton is going to, to leave from Morris Island. Uh, she's going to go back to Beaufort, South Carolina for, for a time before returning to Hilton Head. Uh, Beaufort um, had numerous Civil War hospital sites, um, and uh, many of them are going to be treating some of the, the 54th Massachusetts. Um, one of the camps in Beaufort is known as Camp Shaw. Um, and uh, this is what Susie King Taylor writes um, about one of her visits to, that to the hospital there. She says, quote, I visited the hospital in Beaufort where I met Clara Barton. There were a number of sick and wounded soldiers there and I went often to see the comrades. Miss Barton was always very, very cordial to, toward me and I honored her for her devotion and her care of those men. So in this case, we do have two very famous Civil War nurses actually meeting up. Um, Clara Barton and Susie King Taylor in the same place in South Carolina in 1863. So she worked in the battlefield setting, um, makeshift field hospital, then briefly in the military hospitals at Beaufort um, until her supplies are exhausted. Uh, she is forced ultimately to leave Morris Island before going to Beaufort uh, and goes back to Hilton Head. All through this experience, Barton is very unhappy. Uh, and this is mostly the reason that this part of her story doesn't get as much of the uh, notoriety, much as much written about it, because she hated her experience there. And a lot of her writings are very, very negative about the U.S. Army that she worked with there, um, about the officers she worked with, the climate, uh, the disease. It's not a, a super pleasant place to be, especially in the summer in the Sea Islands. And so she ultimately leaves at the end of 1863, and goes back 
uh, north uh, to, uh, to, to Washington, D.C., back to her boarding house home to uh, ultimately go back to the battlefields of Virginia. But before she left, she actually has a pretty important experience that it's going to shape the rest of her life, um, and especially her views on race and slavery. So while she was still in Hilton Head, before departing for Virginia, she learned of a smallpox epidemic among the freed people population at St. Helena's Island, which is just north of Hilton Head. Um, because Barton has all, she does have some supplies left at Hilton Head, uh, and she is going to be leaving, so she wants to distribute these supplies. And she figures that this group of people um, who are getting no government support whatsoever could really be helped by uh, by this th these supplies that she has on hand. And so through a, uh, a freedman um, named Columbus Simmons, uh, Barton is actually going to distribute these supplies uh, to St. Helens Island. Um, and they're going to do a lot of good for the people who are suffering uh, throughout this epidemic. Smallpox is one of the most feared diseases of the Civil War um, and one that, uh, that Barton uh, knew well um, and that the US Army knew well, but the Army did very little for, uh, for the refugee populations that came into their lines. So Clara Barton's role here is really giving these supplies to uh, this freed people population that had no, uh, no other place to turn. So Barton's gonna be very well remembered among this community uh, for her work there during the Civil War. She also befriends an abolitionist um, a, a teacher named Francis Gage while in South Carolina. Uh, and this is going to influence her politics. Uh, it's going to influence the way that she looks at slavery, the way she looks at the abolitionist movement. And you can see a change in Barton's writings during this time that she became, becomes much more anti-slavery. She becomes an abolitionist. Um, and she uh, sees up close and personal through the, some of the free people she interacts with the very real physical and emotional scars of slavery, and it changes her forever. And this is going to influence some of her decisions later in life. So uh, Barton goes on after South Carolina uh, battlefields in 1864. She founds the uh, Missing Soldiers Office in 1865. Uh, so she is very much involved with Reconstruction, but not necessarily involved with the politics of Reconstruction. That changes, though, with the 15th Amendment. Um, she is actually a supporter of the 15th Amendment, um, which is going to give African-American men the right to vote. Uh, this was opposed in many cases by white suffragists, uh, white women suffragists, who believed that white women should get the right to vote before black men. Uh, Clara Barton stood opposed to those white suffragists, made some enemies as a result of it. Uh, and Barton actually wrote uh, to a friend, she said, quote, no person in this house could be more rejoiced than myself if it could be decided to admit at the same moment to voice in the government all persons and classes of persons naturally and properly entitled to it and not now so admitted. But if the door be not wide enough to admit us all at once and one must wait, then I am willing. I am willing to stand back and see the old, scarred, limping slave clank his broken fetters through before me while I stand with head uncovered, thanking God for the, for the release. She understood that African-American men needed the right to vote. They were more in danger um, of, of the kind of already starting lash against Reconstruction. She was already witnessing and seeing in the newspapers and in some cases firsthand. So she is very much engaged in this kind of conversation. And she's not done with South Carolina. It, it shapes her life, but she's going to return back there 30 years after she was there during the Civil War. In 1893, a massive hurricane uh, hits the sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia. It remains one of the deadliest natural disasters in American history, an estimated uh, 1,000 to 2,000 people died during it. Uh, entire towns and communities are washed out to sea in the, in the storm surge. Um, Clara Barton returns to South Carolina, this time with the American Red Cross. So all of that experience she had during the Civil War, she funnels it into uh, founding the American chapter of the Red Cross in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, and by 1893, she is well established as a relief organizer, humanitarian known around the world. Uh, and she is going to return um, and 
among the survivors of this storm, she's going to be working with some of the same freed people that she interacted with uh, 30 years earlier in 1863 uh, and their descendants. And she made that connection. She felt very personally invested in these communities. Uh, and so she spent the next 10 months after this hurricane uh, struck this region. She spends helping to rebuild with the American Red Cross this community. So this place was really, really important to Barton and really important to, to her life and her work. Uh, but it doesn't get a lot of the, uh, the notoriety that it, it really should uh, because this time in this humid disease ravaged South Carolina uh, communities, this region, it shaped her views on some of the most crucial issues of, of her time. Um, and I think we should definitely take a harder look at some of the uh, experiences that Barton had um, in, in this location. So that brings an end to my part of the program for today. Um, so I'm bringing back up our video and chat. So see if we have any, any questions here. Um, all right, so we have one from Christina. Uh, where's the, the Clara Barton Museum? Um, so the Missing Soldiers Office is here in Washington, D.C. It's right in the heart of downtown uh, D.C. Um, and uh, located about two blocks from the National Archives, um, two blocks from uh, the uh, Capital One Arena. So right in the heart of downtown D.C. You can find information about us at clarabartonmuseum.org. I'll drop that link into the, uh, into the chat section. Um, okay, this uh, throw it out to both of you. Um, this question here is, how would you compare the experience of union nurses and charity workers to that of Confederate nurses? Were they similar or vastly different? Any thoughts? I'll go first. <laughs> um, so on one hand, there's not quite a Confederate version of the US Sanitary Commission. So as far as bureaucracy goes, I mean, this is kind of and increasingly becomes a standard for the Confederate States, a uh, bureaucratic nightmare, um, <laughs> to put it lightly. Uh, and so you don't see kind of that level of um, organization among some of the women, but there are certainly on local levels kind of actually quite similar to what you were describing, Emily, with, with Frederick and other places of local organizations of churches being converted, of all of these places being converted to hospitals and women getting involved there. There are also several women nurses um, that are moving alongside um, armies and often are actually kind of under this jurisdiction of whoever is the doctor in charge, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so there is a bit more of a class dynamic when it comes to Confederate nurses. Uh, some elite women go along, but for the most part, and people actually like Mary Boykin Chestnut actually went on record saying that like, too gross, <laughs> too gross in there. And this kind of dirty work was beneath her essentially. And so a lot of the like elite Southern women, uh, white women found that it was um, a lot more kind of glamorous to kind of host some of these sewing circles and band circles, which again, these relief efforts are and were essential, but um, the the changing of bed sheets, the wrapping and dressing of wounds, the shaving of a face of a strange man was very outside of the realm of propriety for, I mean, any woman in the 19th century, but the Southern ladies were especially kind of did not like this. There's very much a classed nature within Northern hospitals as well, with who are the women actually doing the dirty work and why are so many of them unnamed? Um, a lot of the women that we talk about are almost kind of like the matrons and that they're the ones kind of scheduling, like, where's the food coming from? Where are the things going to? And so a lot of the, the dirtier chores are to lower class white and black women. And that is why so many on the Confederate side, so many of these nurses, but not only nurses, but like cooks and again, laundresses, like being a laundress is a terrible job. Um, can you imagine? Um, they are often enslaved women. Uh, and so that is something that you don't, I mean, you don't see a lot of enslaved women following along um, the kind of union nurses and union armies, but you do see sometimes women who are classified as contraband um, Susie King Taylor was never paid for her work and her husband never got a pension. So I'm, I'm kind of spinning my wheels a little bit, but yeah, so you see a bit more like Northern women as reformers and as women who are more willing to go out into the public sphere, you see them do that a lot more 
Whereas in the South, women of the same class might kind of fall back upon gender norms a little bit more. Gotcha, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Melissa. Um, I'll, I'll just note a, a little bit, um, a, a little bit there my, myself, um, just to say that, um, you know, looking at the experiences in, in Frederick, I, I think that um, going back to, to Frederick is, is a place that the museum is obviously very interested in the Civil War experiences that, that happen there. Um, and when we look at some of the nurses that, that work in the Civil War hospitals in Frederick, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see their, their experiences as directly compared to some of the Confederate women who are going to come in the, these, um, what did they call them, Emily, the, the Tory, the Tory sympathizers? That's what they were calling them in Frederick, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because some of the women that do work in Frederick are, uh, do have Confederate sympathies, um, and they are working in some cases side by side with some of the Union uh, women who are going to be working in these hospitals. And it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic to look at, at these experiences. I think of, um, is, she's not a nurse, um, but I think of the diarist Catherine Markell uh, in Frederick, um, who's a great source of, of information from a Confederate uh, woman perspective. And just to see side by side um, her views compared with some of the uh, union women that work in the organization, uh, the relief organization in Frederick or uh, Jacob Engelbrecht, who is obviously not a woman, but also a diarist at the same time. It's really interesting to, to look at these uh, sources and compare and contrast their experiences in the same places doing the same work um, and, and it, having the same experiences. It's, um, I think, really a really important part to, to make these comparisons um, to draw these connections to see how was this experience different from union nurses, Confederate nurses, to see how did they experience the same kinds of, of experiences, things like mass casualty care? What, how do they respond when suddenly 300 patients are brought in? Do they, do they respond in the same way or is they're going towards like the, the differences in the ways that North and South you gender? Do those components come into play? I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I, I think it's a it's a really interesting dynamic to look at. All right, I don't see any more questions here, so I think this is a good spot to to leave it for today. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Develvis and and Emily. Thank you so much for for coming on today. Really appreciate your insights and your research. Thank you. This was so fun. Thank you all for listening to me ramble, as always. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Yeah, it was fun. Excellent. So we will see you uh, tomorrow over on the National Museum of Civil War Medicine's Facebook page. We'll be doing a live stream from the uh, Spangler Farm at Gettysburg at 1 p.m. Um, that will also uh, make its way over here to YouTube as well after the live stream is completed. Um, we have lots of programs coming up in the next couple of weeks um, on both Facebook and YouTube. You can tune in. Uh, you can find those videos by subscribing or following us on all our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, here on YouTube, uh, over on Reddit as well. Uh, you can find us there, learn more about Civil War medicine, um, and uh, we hope you'll follow us, and uh, we will see you next time. Hope you all have a great week. All right. All good. Yay.